Hello there, good evening from India. And there is everybody. So we are back with another episode of Indus Think. And this is the seventh episode. I'd like to thank everyone for their support we have had throughout. So this is this is gonna be a very interesting discussion, considering the fact that many quote unquote scholars, quote unquote experts, and people have discussed the concept of a civilization state. And tonight, if you say or today, oops, which is based on the time that you're watching on, we are going to discuss about India as a civilization state, as as in the aspect of what should be understood. So there will be uh, generally four frontiers of understanding which we will discuss. One will be law, second will be policy, third will be international affairs, and the fourth will be history and culture. So uh, we have nearly everyone in the, I would say, studio except Cypria. So she might be joining in some time, I hope. And I would like to introduce the Twitter RT again. We have Kartike, we have Kiran, we have our dear Richard. So without wasting any time, I'll just give a little bit briefing about what are we going to discuss and why. Because it's my intent of having this episode is not to just start a discussion of uh, India as a civilization state conceptually and practically and just end it today. Of course, we would like to cut some slack tonight and you know we would not like to go too much long, but that's another thing. But still, it will be a part two part series. It will be part of it will be a part of the longer series on a discussion on India as a civilization state. So what is the context, very specifically speaking? The context is quite simple. So what happens is that we consider that you know territories make civilizations, empires make civilization, your soft power sometimes, quote unquote, in whatever way you want to say, makes your own civilizational instinct. Now we can find it in history in many forms of possible. I don't need to give any examples. I think from the Soviets to the United States to Russia, uh, sorry, to the Chinese to even India, often known as Jambudvi in the past, we know that such examples exist. So the proposition that I will make is the simple is that uh, I believe uh, Richard will be taking the geopolitical angle of it. I believe uh, Kiran will be taking the cultural and spiritual angle of it. I believe Karthike would be taking the legal and history angle of it. Uh, my angle will be policy based strictly on how the technicality works and whether it matters or not. And wherever I would ask questions, I would ask in such a manner to ensure that let's see whether there is some litmus test which we need to pass to show that, you know, fine, we have a civilizational identity as India and all of that, but practically how will it work out in the future? Because we see a lot of discussions about India's incompetence and we know about the problems of the IFS and other things. But practically, it's not just that everything has been so perfect. Even historically, we see the kingdoms, they have their own dilemmas and problems. So my proposition is quite simple, that we should see it from a hard loss and soft law perspective also. Because what happens is that civilizational identity is not just about whether it is a factual thing that civilizations exist, but it's also about a sense of uh, showing up that, you know what, this is what our identity is. This is what our considerations are. That is how various identities come and identities even, you know, submerge, mix and various, you know, various fusions and fissions are made. Uh, we can take the history of Mongolia. We can take the history of other places. And I don't wish to go into that so much. So to begin with, uh, I'd like to ask Karthike to go ahead and then we'll go in a clockwise and let's see if uh, Cypria joins in and then we'll also add in the discussion. So Karthike has your floor. Yeah. So uh, as we are discussing, you know, what is a civilizational state and in order to understand that it is very important to understand what civilization constitutes. So if you see at the heart, uh, a civilization has a common chord a common denominator, a, f a feature or a grand norm, as we discussed in the secularism chapter, a basic concept which unites all the groups within a particular territory. So this could be a religious identity, common values, common worldview, a uh, common sacred language, etc. So now if a political setup functions on the basis of these denominators, we can say that it's a civilizational state. Now, in geopolitics and in, under international law, there is no separate, uh, you know, identities of how states are. It's a, basically that there is a sovereign equality and every state is kind of based on a nation state system. And there are other kind, there are different kinds of government, a government there. So in order to understand civilizational state, I think two examples are very important. 
uh, one is China and the other one is Europe. So I would like to discuss them briefly. So first, let's start with China. So the national myth, China has a concept of a common myth, in my opinion, that the national myth that unites the Chinese people is under one goal, which is based upon the idea of this Middle Kingdom, which has taken modern shape of a Confucius Leninist sort of model. And this detests the Western imperialism. And therefore, if we hear, you know, arguments like uh, we are we are against the imposition of the Western concept of international law in the South China Sea, etc. And uh, so this is their basic common myth that unites every uh, all the Chinese people. And uh, the other great example is Europe. So now we know Europe is a very, you know, uh, recent term. Till in all, all through history, Europe was always referred as Christendom. It was never called Europe as such. So, uh, and when I say Europe, I'm leaving the Slavic Europe since Slavic Europe were, you know, Oriental Euro according to the Western people that they they were not the same one. You know, they don't are they are not equal. So therefore, so Christendom is basically Western Europe till the, till Poland. Poland is the defining line. So. Uh, uh, in, in Europe, you can say that civilizational ent entity there or the grand norm there is basically a religious identity. And uh, civilizational spirit in Europe has roots in deep Christian values. I, I won't say Judeo-Christian values. I'll say just primarily Christian, Christian Christianity that developed there. So Europe itself is a recent term, as, as I discussed before. And I think it was T.S. Eliot, I think he mentioned in one of his works that Christianity is the bedrock of Western civilization. And another interesting aspect of European civilization uh, is their sense of uh, continuity, which has roots in Greco-Roman civilization. So, uh, and I think this has been discussed. Somebody said that all Western philosophy are basically footnotes to Plato. And uh, all these things actually mark that there's a continuity which is happening uh, from the Greco-Roman empire and now the Christian identity of the same geographic region and in the, in the during the reformation period we saw that greek myths and greek motives resurrected in mainstream european art writing philosophy etc and uh, as it is said that uh, you know greco roman civilization still present in uh, in the countries of western in the western world basically and we can see that the art and architecture have been appropriated everywhere. So Roman Empire was also succeeded by everyone. Everybody claims that they are the unofficially claim that they are the successors of French. Oh, uh, sorry, the Roman Empire. The French also claims that claim that the Eastern Europe, uh, the Byzantine Empire also used to say that we are the central Rome, Roman capital. And then even the USA, US. Uh, uh, so you remember the fascist symbol is basically the fascist sticks and the axe. And which was approved. This is basically a very old Italian uh, civilization thing, the, which marked for power, and the Romans, you know, appropriated it. And then it was appropriated everywhere. So in uh, U.S. House of Representatives, we see the same thing. You know, uh, it's designed there. Even the popular French uh, emblem had the, the fasci sticks and the axe. And um, so many American cities are uh, have actually the name have origin in Greek uh, language. And when Edinburgh was made, because Scotland, the Edinburgh was the capital of uh, Scottish Renaissance, and there Edinburgh was called the Athens of the North. So we can see this continuity happening in a Christian context. And I think this is what a civilizational state is. Like they have a continuity and a basic grand norm that unites everybody. So I'll, I'll just keep it ended here. And then later on, we'll discuss how whether India satisfies these criteria and whether we can call it a civilizational state. Great. So, uh, Kiran, you can give more context on that, and then maybe Richard can go. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Karthika. It's really interesting uh, examples. And uh, I would just like to give a small history of India as a civilization. And India was recognized also as a civilization uh, internally. Uh, all the Indians throughout history, they knew of themselves as a civilization, as contrast to people who are outside, but also externally. As so Greeks knew what India was, and the Chinese knew what India was. So let's look at an example of a very famous uh, Chinese visitor, Shuan Zhang, uh, who visited India and who visited also Central Asia. And he traveled like personally through all these regions 
and um, actually wrote prolifically about all these places, their customs, their people, their habits. It's fantastic uh, work available also uh, today uh, in translations in English and hopefully also in Indian languages soon. And what he clearly mentions is that there is a geographical point past this Langham area in Afghanistan, where he actually, until then, he talks about different um, desha, different kingdoms. Then he stops. He doesn't talk about a specific kingdom. He has a long paragraph of India. What is India? What is Indian uh, civilization? What is Indian values? What is Indian ethics? And then he basically talks a lot about that. And then he goes on about the other regions, like in Punjab, uh, actually Gandhara in Afghanistan as well, and all, all these areas. And then he has a huge description of many, many, many kingdoms and provinces in India. So he was very clear what India was. And he also mentions what Indian um, uh, Indians themselves uh, think of this geography. And he mentioned this uh, Jambudvipa. It's like a very popular uh, accepted word all over Asia uh, for this geography. Somehow the Europeans didn't use it and we, uh, we just uh, ignore this word. We should just call the Indian subcontinent as Jambudvipa because Chinese, Japanese, about half the world actually recognizes that. So he says that the Jambudvipa is divided into four regions. Uh, and these four regions at one point in time were ruled by a Chakravarti, like a one single Chakravarti who was controlling the whole area. So he was aware of a historical uh, recognition and consciousness that all this was part of a state. And over time, because evolution of politics and so on, some, some regions would uh, you know separate, but there are still Chakravartis of different orders. So there will be a Chakravarti who will be ruling three of these four regions. There will be a Chakravarti who will be ruling two of them. And finally, one who will be ruling only of one of them. And the last two are actually what we would currently call the Indian subcontinent, which is the India and Pakistan. So um, the eastern part is the second to go. And the southern part, which is actually along the, the Indus Valley and until the sea, this was the last to go. So this was all uh, uh, mentioned so like uh, like that with uh, by um, uh, by Shuan Sang. And what he mentions is that um, these uh, recognition of these Chakravartis, and they also yeah put various state apparatus right. So all this was uh, what was available uh, as as uh, foreigners actually. Uh, knew about India because it, we had a functional civilizational state and this was uh, they had emblems state emblems and uh, we have that also in our Indic literature so if we, we look at uh, our literature so the word Bharat goes all the way from uh, to Rig Veda but then there is also the Manusmriti where a very conscious description of civilizational expansion was mentioned so they, they stated that they stated that uh, they started in the Brahmavarta, the region between the Saraswati and the Trishadvati rivers, uh, and it was the core, and it's basically where we expect the Vedas to be composed, and then it expanded to the Majadesha, which is actually the Kurukshetra war on, on this central region around Haryana and, and Sindhu Saraswati civilization, where we have all the uh, the relics of the archaeology, what what we find today, the most ancient relics. And uh, then they, they, he says there's the Aryavarta, which is between the two mountain ranges, Himalaya and, uh, and um, India, which is all cu agriculturally cultivated, like well expanded uh, uh, agricultural irrigation networks and a huge population base, naturally, because we have a large agricultural basis. In fact, the largest in the world. So this is why we had a lot of wealth. And then he had a fourth term called Yajna Desha, the land that is fit for Yajna. And that is the whole of India because he mentions this is the habitat of the Krishnamraga, the black antelope. The black antelope, if you look at the biological habitat, it's exactly the Indian subcontinent. So he describes that, uh, well, we don't know who wrote this, but the Manusmriti describes very clearly what India is and what India as a civilization was, uh, what are the norms are, because he mentions the word yajna, yajniyo desa. And we can argue that even the names we have for India, like the Bharat, comes from uh, the Bharatas of or the people who are bearing the fire in so it's an yajna related thing and then we also have the Shuanzang himself mentioning that the name for India comes from the name for the moon Indu so he says that Indu uh, is what the Indians themselves call which sometimes is translated as Hindu or Sindhu and this Indu is actually again uh, an outcome of yajna so the Soma which is basically coming at the end of the yajna so we see, you know, also images in the uh, Sindhu Saraswati uh, um, uh, seals 
uh, all these uh, yajna related symbols uh, very clearly visible with the iconography and some of these have traveled abroad because you know india was a very powerful civilizational state we, it had money it had uh, uh, civilizational seals so they, they spread up uh, and you see them in mesopotamia iran area they, you also see them in europe and probably also in china and if you look at one good example is um, the indian symbol of the lion so lion is an indian animal right it's very very popularly used all over uh, the world especially in europe it's a symbol of state power europe actually eradicated lions long ago so where did it where did they get it so if you don't want to you know point to india there there is a second symbol which is like a, a straight forward from india there is no other ambiguity about it it's the unicorn and if you look at the british royal seal it has the lion and the unicorn on two sides so basically indian symbols copied how did it happen somehow through uh, you know uh, trade civilizational exchanges and so this is the context in which india was basically uh, evolving as a civilizational state for a long time we have solid uh, concrete uh, uh, evidence for this through languages through rituals through cultural artifacts all that at some point in the last uh, yeah a couple of hundred years uh, because of colonization uh, this memory the civilizational memory was somehow forgotten not all over the place but there is actually a propaganda that uh, you know india was created by the british which is absolutely ridiculous <laughs> um, so this is where we are and um, i would like to just stop here uh, just to give the contrast to what kartikeya mentioned we do have all the basis for a civilizational state in our history yeah that excellent that uh, that's really that's excellent. excellent so okay so i'd like to introduce somebody and uh, considering the occasion i'd like to introduce uh, saipriya also uh, so hi and uh, what we'll uh, i'll just explain the format again because uh, shall no problem so uh, i'll just explain the format again as we proceed so we will be discussing in a clockwise manner as the screen shows so uh, what we are what we are discussing are just the basics so kartike is discussing the legal and history aspects uh, kiran is discussing the cultural aspects ruchir will be discussing geopolitical aspects of what is a civilizational identity uh, i believe you might be and you know you might have some limited ex and limited expertise in discussing the spiritual and cultural aspects as well so in case uh, you would like to take the lead we can have you or we may ask ruchir to continue as you wish so yeah i just want to add to what uh, kiran said here um there there was an ancient concept of uh, bharat as a civilization but that sort of fell off and why it fell off was because uh, the last time we saw um india united uh was maybe under the guptas and the mauryas and uh, after that it sort of broke up into a series of confederacies power always changing hands every couple uh decades or centuries or whatever and um, by the time the europeans came in while the ancient world did regard india as a civilization they lost that um sort of perspective on india because they saw it as a um you know an aggregate of uh, confederacies and then when um, indology began i mean indological studies began maybe 16th century 17th century and they started shaping the idea of what india is right now as we know it today because whatever we read about india unfortunately as a political entity is by uh, europeans so when they started forming the idea of india as a uh, you know a, a an, an entity they didn't they didn't see it as a united uh, you know sovereign state they didn't see it as a civilization as we know it they they not only um, you know Uh, formulated all these theories that sort of divided the continuity of the history so they said the aryan civilization the harappan civilization fell off and there's no continuity and maybe they they of course didn't have enough evidence at that point of time um they but they did make a lot of assumptions that stuck so uh when indology sort of uh couldn't convey india as a um uh, as a single entity and uh, that's what we study and that's what we base our policy on it becomes it becomes as if the indian people themselves have become a, a historical had they've 
it's not about it's not just about learning ancient history it's about um it's about having the intellectual basis to call yourself a polit- like there no matter how much we argue that um, sorry i'm starting multiple sentences and i'm not ending them but um no matter how much we argue that india was a single entity they someone or someone or the other still comes and says the british made it uh, or united it or it was a series of princely states and that argument has, has a little bit of merit in a way but uh the thing was the fragmentation of the history makes it easy for them to make that make that argument so we need to sort of form uh form a basis to imagine india as one entity so we need to sort of establish a cultural and historical continuity we need to uh trace it to our ancient civilization um and then we can start thinking of uh our people as one even even right now if we see uh, how indians look at their own people it's in a sort of a colonial manner like uh you see you see the other tribe as another tribe or a caste and you no one no one thinks of the country as this is my people this is my uh you know um um this is the cultural unity i have with the race you know so um what happens is uh, indology played a big role in this is what i'm coming at um there's a there's a they they've argued lot of scholars argued that um um india's a historical which is partly true and um it's very it's kind of difficult to establish or prove them otherwise uh, but uh, there are uh, you know there are there there needs to be some you know um unification and uh, reclaiming of history in order for this to happen um so we need to ha- start uh, um using our own lenses to, to look at history we need more studies to look at what is the types of uh, polity that was practiced in uh, medieval india uh, i mean pre mughal india sorry uh, and then come to the conclusion uh, whether the you know there there's definitely geographical fabric there's definitely geographical continuity because you see you see people from the south going to pilgrimage in the north and people come from the uh, um, north uh, going to pilgrimage in the south so there's definitely a geographical idea and a geographical consensus amongst the indian people but uh, politically that that uh, factor was missing and this is why it was so easy for them to say that the indian state was fragmented it, it didn't have doesn't have a continuous political history it doesn't ha- have a you know united consciousness you know so uh, i just want to add to that i i feel like indology played a huge role in you know changing that consciousness of the people and of history in general uh to you know it um Uh, and obviously we know the aryan invasion theory and all the stuff they introduced the um the fictionalization of our myths and our itihasa like um they they don't regard indian texts as uh, authoritative sources at all so that's one thing we really need to work on in order to establish these sort of narratives in our consciousness you know and uh, i guess that's the only way to move forward for us also because um without a certain idea and a certain vision of what what we not only were but want to be uh and it's not just about economics you know it's about uh your identity your uh, um vision as a country and that makes a makes a difference in um, that makes a difference in uh, how policy is formed and how geopolitics plays a role in uh, shaping you know relations international relations and all of that so yeah i think i think i'm i, I think i'm that's it and i chime in when you guys uh, talk more great so ruchir can give more context in the aspect of how it works in international relations and then maybe i could have some follow up questions from my side Sure. So thanks so much uh, to all of you for the great foundation you built uh, historically, culturally. So now if we look at 
geopolitics today. And we ask ourselves, what is a civilizational state? What are the examples of civilizational states? We have to first uh, look at you know, what the standard state is. Now, the standard state in the Eurocentric history or geography that we're taught is a continental European nation state. What does a nation state mean? A nation is an ethno-linguistic community that's tied through uh, imagined bonds. You know, you don't know every single person in your nation, but you have this subconscious feeling that, oh, because we share the same language or the same ethnicity, which in Europe is conflated with language, so language is ethnicity until recently, uh, we are one, and hence that gives us a right to self-determination and to exist as a nation. Now, this is can be seen, the best example is the various partitions of European states in the 19th and uh, 20th centuries. Uh, for example, there was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was a multinational, multilinguistic, multi-ethnic, composite uh, monarchy, which after World War I, was divided on the basis of linguistics and ethnicity. That it was carved up into Czechoslovakia, it was carved up into German Austria, it was carved up into a rump state of Hungary, then uh, Croatia and Bosnia were given to a new kingdom called uh, the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, later to become Yugoslavia. And uh, you also had Poland, which was resurrected from uh, the ashes. It had ceased to exist for a while, uh, having been carved up in the past. And it was all based on uh, surveys, based uh, which counted you know, what language was spoken in each district, in each settlement. Now, this conception does not really apply to other continents. That if you look at North America, South America, and uh, Oceania, or uh, let's say Australia, New Zealand, these are all settler colonies. They don't have uh, a definition based on a nation uh, in this sense, or ethno-linguistics. They are settled by European invaders who then created outposts of what they call Western civilization. Whereas Western civilization is a huge misnomer uh, because there's no Western civilization, just like there's no Eastern civilization, it's a gross oversimplification. In fact, there isn't even a European civilization or European culture because there isn't a continent called Europe. There's a European subcontinent on the continent of Eurasia. We know that it's one continent because the Mongols came without any geographical obstacle and raided uh, Europe and even settled there. There's many Central Asians who, you know, for example, Hungary, Bulgaria, Turkey are settled by. Uh, the descendants of Central Asians who came unobstructed. So what you do have in the European subcontinent of the Eurasian continent are a distinct Hellenistic civilization, a distinct Celtic civilization, a distinct Latin civilization, distinct Slavic uh, civilization, distinct Germanic civilization, distinct Nordic civilization, distinct Baltic civilization, distinct Magyar uh, or uh, Hungarian civilization. Now, these do not always find themselves expressed in the form of a state, but some of them do. And in the rest of Eurasia, you see much better examples. So Russia, China, and India are examples of civilization states because they see themselves as the successors to uh, centuries or millennia of a certain uh, set of values, beliefs, uh, and, uh, and as we said, imagined communities. Now, another example could also be Iran, which is a Persian civilization state, as well as a Shia civilization state. So it, it functions as a two-in-one package. Under the Shah, uh, before he was deposed, there was a conscious attempt to reclaim Iran as the successor to Cyrus and Darius, of the ancient period uh, of uh, by the festival of Persepolis. So there was a huge festival where they invited the world's royalty and diplomats and presidents uh, to the ancient capital of Persepolis and engaged in traditional Persianate 
revivalism around Darius, around Cyrus, uh, that was unfortunately nipped in the bud after the Iranian revolution. But there is still a very distinct Persian civilizational conception of what their ethnicity is, as well as now reinforced by being the guardian of Shia Islam, as opposed to uh, Saudi Arabia, the guardians of Sunni Islam. Now, what else can be considered a civilizational state? Turkey is a very interesting example. Turkey sees itself as the successor state to the Turkic civilization, even though the Turkic civilization comes from what's now Xinjiang and Kazakhstan. Now, Xinjiang has its own challenges, being part of the People's Republic of China, and Kazakhstan is uh, not exactly a power player in geopolitics, which leads to this bizarre situation where Turkey, modern-day Turkey, the people do, are not ethnically related on the whole to the original Turks, to Ertugul and all these Ghazis who are so popular in, uh, in Pakistan, for example. Uh, a very small percentage of them are actual descendants of uh, Turkic tribes. Most of them are Anatolians, Greeks, and Armenians who were forcibly converted and forced to speak Turkish and now have been taught by centuries of the state to see themselves as Turkish. As a result, they are the successors to the Turkic civilization and act in that way. So when we see neo-Ottomanism, what they call Erdogan's uh, ideology, it's an expression of that. And you see very interesting uh, uh, incidents, especially nowadays as DNA testing has become accessible to all, of uh, very proud Turkish nationalists, civilizational nationalists taking DNA tests and then being told that they're 90% Greek and 10% Armenian, and then raging on the internet that this is a Zionist conspiracy by you know evil Israeli DNA testing companies to destroy the Turkish bloodline and uh, civilizational identity, whereas it only shows to uh, proves to uh, everyone that this is how the civilization transferred itself and poured itself into an empty vessel, so to speak, and continues to live. So Turkey is a civilizational state. Iran is a civilizational state. Uh, in, uh, if we go a little bit more west, uh, can Greece be considered a civilizational state? I would argue yes, uh, not because of ancient Greece, but because of Byzantium. It, the independence movement of Greece, which started 200 years ago in 1821 against the Ottoman Turks, was not necessarily a revival of the ancient Hellenistic uh, principles, although that was uh, an important part of crafting that identity, but it was tied more closely to the loss of Constantinople, the loss of Byzantium, and the reassertion of that Orthodox Christianity uh, that had been suppressed and their identity as the second Rome, as Kartike mentioned. So that's a civilizational state. Russia, you know, after the fall of Byzantium, called themselves the Third Rome, and Russia has a very unique composite culture as well. That it's difficult to call Russia, you know, a nation state because it has many ethnicities, it has many different subcultures, but it's tied together by this shared destiny. And that could be as the as the Kievan Rus, it could be as the Russian Empire, it could be as the Soviet Union, and it could be now as the Russian Federation. In the rest of the world, let's say in, in Africa, unfortunately, because of colonialism, uh, the borders have been drawn in such a way to prevent any assertion of civilizational identity. So the only civilizational state in Africa is Ethiopia, the only country to never have been colonized. You can draw a straight line between ancient, medieval, and modern Ethiopia. And the as a result, the rest of uh, Africa, when they were fighting for independence. Even in the Caribbean, when Afro-Caribbeans were fighting for independence, who did they look up to as the godfather of all African nationalism? They looked up to Ethiopia. They looked up to Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, uh, Rastafari Makonnen, as, you know, in some cases, even as a prophet to be worshipped. Uh, and a lot of the flags, so the colors of African nationalism come from the colors of the Ethiopian flag. That's why Ghana, Cameroon, Guinea all have a combination of green, yellow, and red in their flags to pay tribute to the only African civilization that was never colonized. And in fact, defeated Europeans who came to colonize it like uh, Italy. 
So with that in mind, a civilization state is not an aberration. In fact, there's many of them, but because the Anglosphere doesn't have any, and they have an inferiority complex about that, and instead they would like to say, oh, we have a values-based uh, civilization and anyone can become uh, a Brit uh, you know, British citizen by conforming to these values or an American citizen by conforming to these values. They seek to delegitimize and undermine the existence and concept of a civilizational state. Now, the more countries embrace this uh, concept and this identity, the better it is for everyone because it's more honest. And it, it allows countries to set the terms of the discourse around them and within them that at the end of the day, a state is a vessel for the aspirations of the people and the people are the components, the, you know, the, the atoms of a civilization. And that's important to, to learn, that a state does not exist just to protect the status quo. The state belongs to the people, it belongs to the civilization, and should be harnessed in that direction. Indeed. So let us go with some questions. And then, of course, not from the audience, because they are yet to come. So I will be now putting a follow up questions based on all what we have discussed so far so as to put the trajectory forward we already have <laughs> gone at least some time as we had stipulated out of the total time but fine so one thing we very specifically understand that there is a lack of continuity and uh, when it comes to indological studies we need to do a lot of work in that so as to assert some sort of academic and policy continuity to see how india's civilizational identity has to be achieved now, one thing which Ruchir very interestingly pointed out was about, uh, you know, that fine. I mean, he gave the funniest example of the Turks and the DNA thing. But uh, one example which I refer and I would like to refer is that uh, recently external affairs minister Jashankar went to Georgia just recently. And I think he had his own discussions with Sergei Lavrov in Russia also. I remember that he sub uh, basically gave in the relic of a particular uh, person. I think she was the last queen or something like that of Georgia. And that had some sense of, you know, some people basically pointed out that it's kind of a reconciliating aspect of Vasudeva Kutumbukam, but still we can, I'm just giving an example so we can point out that afterwards. But one main point which I would like to raise and then Karthik again began or maybe we can have it in a jumbled manner, is that it's perfectly fine to have continuity and continuity is something which is necessary. And we can even discuss the pointers as we go on with the discussion as to what continuity does not, which continuity points do not exist, very specifically speaking. But one problem which comes in is about understanding power and competence. So we very well know that whether it is a Shiite Iran or whether it is the previous Iran, or whether it is the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation, or the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great and so forth, they understood the notions of power and competence and asserted that very reasonably. That's why whenever uh, all these Western nations make the notion of global governance, we all know that global governance does not exist. And why it does not exist is because there cannot be a world government. Otherwise, uh, I would have brought Alexa into the discussion <laughs> and then it could have been more interesting. But still, uh, keeping jokes aside on <laughs> what we should discuss on global governance, uh, I think it is important because uh, for any country, even India, for example, I think global governance is something like it's an extens extension of three things. And this is my observation. I may be wrong on that and people may disagree also. First is your national considerations, which are embedded with your cultural identities. They can be as diverse as possible. They can be as homogeneous as possible. It depends. Uh, you can go to Japan and etc. Second is how you shape your foreign affairs. And I, we know that I'm talking in some basic terms, but there is something which is important. The third one is the basic capillary. So what happens is that, okay, fine. Let us say that Croatia as a small country wishes to assert its own whatever contribution to the so-called international community or whatever it is, right? But we know that they might not be capable to do it. The government might, might not have even an agenda or an approach to do it. Of course, education aspects and all of that can be discussed. 
but i think uh, most of the times not just india but many post colonial states just can't do it because they don't understand how to participate because we all know that for centuries to come global governance is not going to be that world government nightmare it's never going to happen it never happened under krishna devaraya it never happened under any other ruler it won't happen even under the united nations so in that sense uh, how should we see it so what we can do is that kartikeya can begin and then uh, from now we can go for follow ups just one request that please uh, take 2 minutes for follow ups and when you give your preliminary remarks just three, take 3 minutes so that we don't go too long yeah so kartikeya you can begin so i'll answer your question before uh, just before answering your question i just want to point two things very interesting actually uh, li- like richard pointed out uh, how turkey see itself as the a civil a, a preserver of uh, a turkic uh, civilization sort of and it's very interesting that the presidential seal of uh, turkey has 16 stars and each stars represent the turkish empires all over the world so one star all is dedicated to the mogal empire and one star is also dedicated to the ghaznavids so uh, this is how they have appropriate uh, the empires everywhere and uh, second interesting point about iran iran is a very great example because although it was totally islamicized in 20 years the persian uh, persians have uh, you know preserved their identity to even in names you see there are very limited islamic names of the uh, iranian people and i know them because most of my clientage are iranians so i see them and they have a, a huge sense of uh, you know attachment with the caucasians because see the uh, uh, they call themselves aryans iran t- ed- 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 means a land of uh, aryans like aryavarta so they uh, even the when the shah took a title it was ary meher or the light of the aryans so they have a very conscious uh, you know s- civilization entity and it's not very common it's not a religious identity because it's it doesn't have it didn't happen in taliban when they blew they they you know destroyed the bamian buddha but they protected persepolis so this is uh, this is the how how you preserve your civilization entity despite changing your religion now uh, coming to your question first i also want to clarify that what i left in the first answer that how we see india as a civilization so i think uh, leaving the common denominator india of language because india is too diverse to uh, you know point out one language but there is always have been a secret language that united everywhere in europe it was the latin it was the latin language that that was the governant or the, or the or the secret language of the church so uh, shakespeare was not famous in europe at all but hobbes was famous all over europe because he wrote in latin and shakespeare used to write in old english so uh, so these are example like despite having local languages there is one language which is everywhere which is the elite or the governing language in india it was sanskrit so uh, this is this might be a common denominator the other one is the value of dharma like dharma you, you know take uh, controls every aspect of our life and we can say that is a united fact uniting fact in india but the third very important part is the geography our imagined identity is through our geographical landmass this landmass and rigveda mahabharat several brahmanas and purans are basically uh extensive uh, me- they have extensive mention of the geographical location where this is this particular part is and when republic of india uh, sort of succeeded the uh, the civilization state our national anthems true united to also united india in a geographical way so punjab sindh gujarat and you so on so forth vindhya himachal yamuna yamuna ganga all these are basically the continuity of a geography which is also represented by a national anthem so we can say that india has a very strong sense of a geographic uh, you know entity and even in the yagyas you do today uh, in the beginning of the yagya you pray to the land god so you say i am present in jambudwipe arvarte bharat khande and then your city name and your mohalla name or the and and then you do that so so even in local prayers you cite the entire geography of your land so of course there's a strong sense of geography and that is what uh, how we can say india is a civilization state now coming back to abhivardhan's question that how you know the government can or the people can assert because the basic point of civilization is to preserve the consciousness or the values of your civilization and of course it at the end of the day it all depends on your political will how are you willing to cave into 
you know diluting your character as a as a civilization and how you how can you assert your civilization values in in your uh, for your national interests so uh, of course the republic of india is a successor and it it is quite visible through the constituent assembly that everybody uh, in the first article we say india that is bharat and during the constituent assembly it was quietly discussed that how why are we calling it bharat and so that's there and we can see a lot of pro- provisions in our constitution that are also based on our civilizational values and uh, like for example uh, we don't translate secularism or these things as a religious we say it's a panth nirpeksh thing like, because we we identify re- tradition rather than religion because we don't have that concept of an organized religion so these are represented in our constitution it all comes down to how willing the government is to assert itself or the political will to do that and in a diverse society of india i think there is a clash of imagined identities now i might be horribly wrong but i think there is a clash of identities happening in india and uh, because th- there are different notion of uh, consciousness in india we say that it's the geography that unites us but in certain sections it's basically the religious identity that unites us so when the pakistan was being created hardcore uh, islamic philosophers in our and many areas actually criticized the existence of pakistan they said that it's haram it's actually not allowed in religion because we don't have a concept of nation state and citizenship so we cannot allow pakistan to create because we have a concept of umma which transcends all geographical boundaries so now it hap- is like when if if a state advances to do something of a civilized or uh, to you know assert our civilizational value and if it why if it in is is in is inconsistent with that sort of identity then what should the government do i think that is the biggest problem we have in india because it's not a problem it's the we can say a sort of hurdle in which stops us for us from asserting our you know civilization values because caa was at the heart was based on to protect Uh, a, uh, a people of your uh, of your culture of your civilization who are being persecuted persecuted everywhere in your neighborhoods it was clearly a civilizational uh, attempt to help them and there was a civilization civilizational duty but it met with protest because it clashed with uh, other identity which i just talked about so every country has different hurdles i think our hurdles are more domestic in nature and maybe we will discuss it i i had so i'm going to stop here uh i i would like to chip in here and uh, add my 2 3 minutes of comments uh um so i find find it very interesting what saipriya mentioned uh, that we actually lack our sense of continuity in our consciousness it is there it's just that we don't express it and uh, we have to rediscover it in big part to the ideological uh, rubbish that has been uh, percolated all over in our media academia and so on but i would like to also m- m- add an important point which is that what is a state okay so before we go into civilization state we have to ask what is a state and the ideas of what is a state in india and in europe or in other places are different so in india we have an idea of what a state is we also have literary history for example uh, the artha shastra and also in, in some context also in the dharma shastras we have this so for me a good example would be the mahabharata period so we can go to the mahabharata period we had different kingdoms right if let's say a european indologist appeared in india in the mahabharata period would they call india as a state or would it be just a chaotic uh, mixture of various kingdoms so they would say yes you know such a chaotic mixture of various kingdoms it didn't have a sense of identity but obviously when we see the mahabharata and we see what happened there we know that this whole thing was a state why is that discrepancy there because our notion of a state is different because our notion is based on dharma and our notion of the ambit of uh, responsibility for uh, uh, governing power for us it's the kshatriyas it's very different from what the europeans had like for example the european notion was a little bit like our police station notion so if some crime happens you go to the police station and uh, you know report it and they say that oh it's not in our area why are you coming here actually you know it's not our problem as long as it doesn't appear in the border right so that is the idea of um, the state as it evolved in europe 
So, you know, you should not go and complain in Poland if something's wrong in Hungary or whatever, right? But it's not the case in India. In, in India, there is a notion of the overall geography. And if Dharma is violated in one part, it is the responsibility of Kshatriyas to go and defend. And that's exactly what we see, like Arjuna doing it. And like throughout our literature, we, we see that happening. And this is also the exchange between the various Kshatriya uh, doing Ashwamedha or whatever. And even um, when Dharmaraja, the Yudhishthira was uh, in um, uh, exile, right? He has uh, information coming from spies of what Duryodhana was doing. And to his despair, he would learn that Duryodhana was actually governing according to Dharma, like very, very well. Because if that was violated, he could go and attack. You know, he 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 was lost that that uh, opportunity to go and uh, claim the aspect on the on the basis of Dharma. So there is a, a, an understanding within the Indian geography of the, I, the the state is based on Dharma, and it is the different. Uh, uh, varnas who have different responsibilities. For example, the Kshatriyas have to defend the dharma of everyone, not just themselves, but everywhere. Similarly, the Brahmanas don't recognize the supreme authority of any Raja, any Kshatriya. They only have the authority of Soma, like the supreme uh, uh, deity over the Yajna. So essentially, it is a kind of a pan-Indian uh, or a pan-universal even uh, a way of looking at it. And the Vedas have similar uh, suggestions saying that Krunvanto Vishwamaryam. So we need to have this kind of a universal way of ambit. So we don't have the confidence and the recognition of our consciousness to express it like that yet. Nah? So for example, if dharma is violated in uh, Pakistan or uh, let's say in Myanmar, we don't go and say defend it because you know that's our responsibility. Uh, but but you know that is how, for example, the United States sees it in some sense. You know, if something is violated in their border, they go and kick their ass. So essentially, uh, that is the the difference in the way a state is seen, and and different kingdoms having different uh, principalities. It's really nothing, and we already have uh, pilgrimages and all that. But also, I'm saying that as the, at the level of governance and uh, law, uh, the ancient way, through the protection of dharma. Uh, the state was defined in a slightly different way. So we can still argue that even in the case where we had different principalities, we had a civilizational state in India. So we just have to express it and we have to rediscover this. Um, so that is my point. And, and, and uh, maybe a small comment about religion, right? Yes, religion is a Western concept. We have different concepts, pantha and traditions and so on. We are free to look at Western religions through our lens. I mean, who is stopping us? From, from looking it through that. And we can accept them as panthas, right? You know, if, if they are willing to, you know, get into this mode, they can actually realize their own civilization, and uh, which is the Indian civilization. So Indonesia, for example, is all Muslim, and they're very comfortable, happily comfortable, like <laughs> with their Indic heritage. So why not actually, you know, enable that uh, kind of discourse also within India? So my, my uh, judgment about this whole thing is that we got disrupted primarily because of colonial uh, you know, invasions, Turkish and then British. And they had a vested interest in destroying the civilizational identity. So, so they had their story and their narrative running for a long, uh, but uh, you know, it's our responsibility to just stop the rubbish. You know, we have to start singing our own song and, and it's based on you know, solid facts. So that is how I, I, I look at it, yeah. That's what... Yeah. Oh. On that note, uh, based on what Kiran said, I remember this uh, this famous quote from a Jewish intellectual about 100 years ago, uh, who was a Yiddish speaker. His mother tongue was Yiddish, which is basically a dialect of German uh, spoken by uh, the Jewish communities as they were of Central and Eastern Europe. He used to say that a language is just a dialect with an army and a navy. Similarly, today, a religion is just a cult with a state backing it. Now, if a religion does not have a state behind it, then its people are orphans. Then it's, they're basically individualized, atomized, and left to their own defenses. Whereas the others, so for example, Judaism has uh, Israel backing it up as you know, a Jewish state. Uh, Shia Islam has uh, Iran. Sunni Islam has not just Saudi Arabia, but in the past also had uh, Egypt and, uh, and Iraq. Uh, and then uh, secular countries, secularism is just rebranded Protestantism. Protestantism is protected uh, by uh, so-called secular countries. And then you have the Vatican for uh, Catholicism. Now, 
there, there are certain faiths which do not have this luxury of a state that actively protects their rights or seeks to uh, further them. Now, that's something that, uh, like Kiran and Karthike mentioned, and, uh, and Priya mentioned as well, with uh, the impact of Orientalism and colonialism has been stripped of them. So, for example, Japan no longer projects Shinto to the rest of the world. They project anime. You know, because that's on purpose. You know, they have been emasculated. They're not allowed to do that anymore because they are a protectorate of the U.S. and have limited sovereignty. Similarly, India has limited sovereignty. And although we're not an official protectorate of any country, well, so we're not even getting the benefits of limited sovereignty that we gave up sovereignty in exchange for security, uh, we don't realize that we don't have the same options that, uh, as other countries. We don't realize that we're a semi-colony because we have all the trappings of a sovereign democratic republic and uh, you know our elites are capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe and face-to-face -face with the elites of the West. And that gives us an illusion that we're equals, but we're not equals. In geopolitics, we're not seen as equals and we don't act as equals either. We act like a soft state and we're treated as a soft state. Now. If the uh, country were to take a more proactive stance and seek to project certain values or seek to protect certain values, you know, you, you, let's say you don't want to go on the uh, front foot, at least on the back foot, you want to defend certain values, there will of course be resistance. We're seeing that internationally right now, that uh, there's a media crescendo around, oh, you know, authoritarian this and electoral autocracy that and illiberalism X, Y, Z. That's to be expected. Uh, that means you're doing a good job. <laughs> if you're upsetting other countries, uh, that criticism is to be welcomed. Embrace the reputation and keep pushing forward because that's the only language they understand. And it's the only language they respect. This is what one has to learn from China, that for 20 years, they faced barbs like this, that, oh, they have no right to host the Olympics when they're, you know, they haven't seen a blue sky in 20 years because of their, uh, their coal burning. Or look at the human rights violations here. Look at their terrible labor standards there. Uh, they, you know, that did not keep up the secretary general of the Communist Party of China up at night worrying, oh, no, the New York Times ran a terrible article about me. He, he's not responsible to the editorial board of the New York Times. It's responsible to 1.3 billion uh, Chinese citizens and does what is in their interest and guarantees the social contract of China, which is to deliver material prosperity and build a civilizational renaissance on that material prosperity so as to erase the shame of what they call the century of humiliation. China was never fully colonized, but for 100 years they faced uh, flooding their market with opium, forcibly opening up the country, uh, the uh, immunity of uh, Western citizens on their territory. And even that is enough to have left a lasting impact on their understanding of how other countries see them and would treat them if you behave in a weak and soft manner. And this is their response to that historical trauma. On the other hand, you have countries like India or Japan, and to some extent, uh, Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, even Greece, uh, who experience an opposite problem, which is after experiencing colonization or military defeat or even ideological defeat, they self-stigmatize. They're like, oh, you know, we're, we've failed because everything that they said, everything the other side said is true. They said, uh, you know, we, even though, you know, for example, the Cold War was won not by the superiority of Western values, but simply because the Eastern Bloc stopped participating, or uh, the Second World War was won because of uh, technological and numerical superiority uh, compared to the other side, the winner will always seek to portray it as a victory of their values, so as to demoralize the enemy. And it's very effective because then the defeated party actually starts believing it. It's like, yes, you know, we lost because we're not democratic enough, we're not secular enough, not Christian enough. And uh, as a result, they self-stigmatize and become incredibly status conscious. And everything they do 
you know, even in foreign policy, they're scared that, oh no, what will the international community think? You know, what if we get punished again? And that's something that uh, it took Russia 10 or 15 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union to overcome under Putin. It's something that Turkey uh, experienced uh, and then overcame first under Ataturk when they won back some territories uh, in the Treaty of Lausanne. And then again, have rediscovered now under Erdogan where they don't care what Western opinion uh, thinks anymore. Uh, they say that, oh, you do what we want on our terms. We're not begging you to enter the EU anymore. You have to pay us or we'll let refugees into your country. You have to pay us or we'll uh, fund jihadis in, uh, in Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, and that is effective. At, you know, who does Germany, who does the EU bow to? China and Turkey. Not to Russia, not to India. Russia and India is like, oh, human rights, this, free your dissidents, you know, make the dissident the prime minister or the president and, you know, abolish democracy. So uh, to save democracy, you have to abolish democracy and install the person that we want for you. So before we go ahead, I want to share something really interesting I got on Twitter. And then uh, I think Priya can continue. So... <laughs> Let me share it in honor of somebody. So again, just for the purposes of fun, but again, it's interesting. So I'm sharing it. So I'm just sharing it for a glimpse and then I'll remove it. So I think all of you can see it. <laughs> so Alexis says, I have no issues with Brits love Churchill. He saved them from Nazis, but he also committed genocide. The most interesting part which he said was this one. <laughs> that 70% of Russians love Stalin. <laughs> So anyways, so I think uh, now we can continue and uh, side the stage is yours. Please go. Yeah, so I just wanted to add uh, to what you guys said. Um, but I, I'll diverge a little bit because you guys covered why we're a civilization, why we're not. We covered all of that. So I just want to talk about what we can do going forward, maybe. and. Um, that is to, you know, like uh, Ruchir sh said, first of all, not, not being scared of having a bad reputation in international media. We know all the international actors uh, seek to establish their worldview upon India and, uh, you know, India being a successful um, dominant or even, you know, assertive state is not in their best interest. It's not, it's not even economically in their best interest because, you know, they can't uh, push their capitalism uh, here with as much vigor if we we reclaim our own identities and all of that um, so so yeah so don't be scared of our reputation is one um, the you know the, all the hit pieces are a good thing like you said um, and the second thing is you know um, since since religion is such a rallying point in uh, India in Indian politics and the state and you know as you said the Hindus are uh, definitely like orphaned by the by their state only because we embrace secularism to such an such a horrific extent that uh, there hasn't been any uh, any addressal there's no addressal of uh, what the history of the hindu is how they've been persecuted just because they're in a majority doesn't mean they have uh, they have all the rights that they you know have and um, inheriting colonial laws has contributed to, you know, uh, the orphaning of the Hindus. So, so uh, you know, you mentioned Poland. Uh, when Poland got its independence, the first thing they did, they're war torn, they're starving. Their people are like literally uh, in uh, the most dire of economic conditions. But the first thing they did was uh, demolish the Roman Catholic Church and uh, build a Eastern Orthodox Church, why would they do that? And the, and the reason for this is that for, in order for the people to progress economically and uh, have a certain vision for the future and uh, you know rebuild and reclaim after colonization, you need a certain uh, you know unifying identity, a unifying goal, uh, a, a plan for the future, uh, cultural identity. Because without culture, there's no there's no incentive for the Indian people to work, stay, build the country. 
and this is why we see india as such as a you know a launch pad for the elite to go abroad it's not it's not a place where people want to stay contribute to the building of the country and they're kind of you know they're also kind of cynical about uh, what the state can do for them which is which is fair because of uh, so many different political and policy factors that have influenced you know our uh, post independence uh, trajectory uh, but um, it's important to establish yourself as a civilizational state just you know e- even if it's just not to further your uh, religious uh, interests and your religious identity uh, abroad it's not about uh, it's not about us wanting world do- hindu world domination no it's about our state having a certain um a certain uh, basis on which the indian people can then contribute positively to the country you know they nobody contributes without having a, a vested interest and a um self protectionism uh, an element of self protectionism you know um and that's what we see with the muslims in india what we see is they they um anyone in a position of power to further their agenda does it without unabashedly and they do it despite a personal cost why is that because they see themselves as um they have a, they have a very clear identity in mind they have a clear vision of what they want india to be what they want uh their religion to do and all of this contributes to economic development and you know the the assertion of india as a state and um this is you know partly in fact partly because of uh, historical consciousness but also because uh, all the colonial institutions that are in place make sure the bureaucracy the education system the you know the judiciary the everyone the the entire system make sure that you don't produce a self assured indian you produce um a civil servant of a western empire you know you don't you don't have an indian um with a clear goal in mind as to what they want their country to look like they they enforce the the policy of the state with a half hearted uh, self serving manner you know and this 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 isn't going to cut it to you know become india has you know huge aspirations is economic aspirations and all of that they're trying to project those but they, all of this is useless without um sort of asserting yourself extremely uh, effectively and uh, on an international not just an international um uh, uh, platform but you know within the country you need to um really uh, look for cultural identity religious identities and it's not about othering someone else or it's not about uh creating hatred between groups and all of that it's about us recognizing whether we like it or not we're the antithesis of pakistan and uh, um it's about us recognizing what we have and what we need to protect and um uh, and asserting that you know uh, and you know i feel like um we need to this may be controversial but we need a bit of lobbying to happen in uh, india we need we need think tanks we need uh people that represent hindu interests to uh, and change policy in that direction judicial activism won't cut it it's very reactionary right so um so yeah that's just you know talking about what to do for going forward uh, i just gave a little bit you guys can go ahead just a quick comment uh, based on that uh and uh, what we had mentioned earlier about uh, japan and south korea and what they export uh so just like japan exports anime uh, korea exports k-pop but uh, do you also notice uh, how korea you know what korea imports and how it's treated so for example uh, in the west uh, dogs have great cultural significance as a result their values protection and projection extends to other countries so when they hear that oh in korea dogs are eaten or in china dogs are eaten they make it their business to go and tell these countries what is and is not acceptable and as a result as of last year i believe dogs are no longer uh, allowed to be killed and eaten for meat in south korea 
because of Western lobbying and values protection. Now, a true sign of India's arrival as a geopolitical force of re relevance is not when we export more Gandhian pacifism and Ahimsa and Vasudeva Kutumbakam, but when we go and tell other countries that you know cow slaughter is unacceptable to us, and you know you are uh, morally inferior to us because you do that, and there's a country that has similar values to India, but is 30 years ahead of us, and that's Sri Lanka, because this is what Sri Lanka does. And Sri Lanka does this with the confidence of having won its civil war. India lost its civil war in 1947 when we got partitioned without a fight. People died anyway. You know, in order to, uh, to avoid violence, that just meant that we didn't engage in violence and civilians died instead. A civil war would have been preferable because then you get legitimacy for your values protection once you win it. And that is the lesson from our own uh, uh, neighborhood that Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka act with impunity because they have the confidence of understanding who they are and what their country and state and values and civilization represents. We don't have that luxury because we have imbibed the enemy's version of, yes, you are losers who always lose because you are inferior people with inferior values and an inferior religion. Great. So uh, since uh, Richard talked about, you know, exporting the idea that, you know what, just stop cow slaughter and all that, I will. I would also like to suggest one thing and then a few questions from the comment section because we have got some good one. There might be sentences, there might be questions. So, I mean, we can export uh, even other things, but uh, okay, I'll do it afterwards. But let's take this question. I think this is much of a question by Deepak Maurya. So I think anybody can answer as much as they wish to. <laughs> I was going to come on Indo-European, but yeah. So do you want to re read out the uh, question? Yeah. Uh, no. uh, Hello? Oh. Yeah. So do you want to read out the question or should I just answer? Sure. Sure. So I, I'll read out it again. No problem. So the question is simple. Uh, should protection of European Romanis be a civilizational interest? That is, given hypothetically domestic situations becomes manageable. So I think, Richard, you can answer that. So I would argue yes. And it has been for many decades that if the Roma community of Europe has an identity today as Roma, it's because of uh, the Indian government reaching out to socialist governments in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe during the Cold War in order to protect their rights and define them as national minorities. And in fact, the current demand of uh, Romani activists in Europe is that they be recognized as national minorities of Indian origin in the countries of uh, the European Union. Now, this is, you know, their flag, for example, was uh, designed in conjunction with India. That's why they have the, the wheel. It comes both from their heritage as nomadic travelers and their caravans, as well as a, uh, a link to our own uh, flag with the Dharma Chakra on it. Uh, that apart, there have been proposals for them to be extended overseas citizenship of India uh, as uh, members of the diaspora, of a very far removed and lost diaspora, but ethnically they are Indian. Uh, culturally, they have done a lot to maintain their heritage despite great pressure. So in many countries, there is no Roma community because they were hunted like animals. This includes France, this includes uh, Switzerland, it includes uh, the United Kingdom. If they exist in any country, it's because those countries were relatively tolerant of them, but even there, they were decimated during the Third Reich. Uh, they were sent to extermination camps. 90% uh, of the population in uh, countries like uh, the Czech Republic were lost. And it is important that we recognize them as both members of the Indian diaspora and as victims of the so-called Western value system, which saw them as inferior beings, which saw them as 
uh, worthy of elimination at the same level as they saw Jews or homosexuals during that period. So they deserve the same protection. And at the moment, similarly to you know uh, communities I mentioned earlier, they are orphaned because they don't have a state of their own. After the Second World War, after the Holocaust, Israel was created and acts as a vehicle to protect Jewish interests worldwide. Uh, the Roma didn't get that. However, there's one caveat to India extending full protection or overseas citizenship or even given dual citizenship one day if that becomes uh, allowed to the Roma community. And that is the environment in post-socialist uh, Europe is so hostile to the Roma that if we give them uh, overseas citizenship or if we give them Indian passports, that is an excuse for these governments in Hungary or in Bulgaria to strip them of their nationality and deport them and say, oh, very good, we got rid of these leeches, we got rid of the slums, they can go back to where they came from, which would be a very poor outcome for them. So the idea should be to ensure that they have the best possible conditions within the countries of which they are citizens and they have the right to equality and access to uh, all the rights that a full citizen of these, this country has. Great. So let's go on with the other portions of this discussion because we're already past some time. Yeah. So I think... Uh, Sean, go ahead, go ahead. So just to add what Ruchi said, I think uh, the, of course, lobbying is important in, in the, the country where they are living but uh, apart from that an, a significant thing which Indian government can do is to inform the Indian population that Romani people are of Indian origin because I have seen that this is not a very well-known fact and we don't have representations of uh, Romani people in our art or culture for example if you read the uh, hunchback men of Notre Dame you'll see Esmeralda and the Romani people you know so in Europe, it's it's there. They know who these people are, but in India, we have forgotten. So as a, as, as a domestic level, we can do that. And then, of course, lobbying also helps. Now, coming back to the discussion, which was going before the question. Uh, so as far as, as I said, that there, uh, there are hurdles in which the government cannot assert itself. But uh, if we see that this is, that there are societal aspirations and a lot society exists because they are living in a in a civilizational uh, setup and they of course an, an uh, a dilution of that aspect will also dilute the society and i think that the glo globalist aspiration is one of them that which is actually diluting the national borders and also ending the identity of people that it's it's becoming a more multicultural world multiculturalism is good but not to an extent that your particular identity gets diminished to a level which cannot be revived. Now coming, I think one of the best example is uh, France. So French government represents itself as the as a guardian of uh, reformation values, values of reformation and the values of the French Revolution. And uh, despite having a population which had certainly there was a clash if we the Charlie Hebdo case and then now the beheading. So there was a clash, but the government made itself clear that these are our values and we are going to protect them. You have to reconcile with it if you want to live here, despite you are a citizen or not. So this sort of clarity is missing, particularly in India, because we let our interest you know, uh, go to the bins in order to maintain a sort of uh, order in our society, because there's a, there's a threat of violence which might you know, annihilate your country into different parts. Great. So let's um, go to the further. Sure, please, please. I would no just problem. had a small comment to what uh, on the Roma issue. Um, I think it's a very uh, useful tool to actually have a set of representatives in the Indian parliament from Indian expatriates abroad, like not necessarily from the Roma. There are a lot of people who have given up Indian citizenship and settled abroad either during the colonial era as Indian shared labor or a bit later. And these are, when India recognizes itself as a civilizational state, these are also part of the Indian civilization. So maybe not exactly the same type of responsibilities as a regular parliamentarian. We have different um, 
uh, houses, right? Like the uh, legislative council or the Rajya Sabha. Similarly, we can create an entity where these voices are heard, and that would be especially useful for people who are facing persecution, like Roma or maybe you know certain Indian origin people in Middle East or in Afghanistan or anywhere. So th these people need to have a voice that is heard by the Indian democracy. So I think that is. Uh, something that you know uh, is within reasonable uh, uh, framework of uh, realizing it um, but um, we do have on the other hand representation for anglo indians you know they don't actually get elected they get elected from their private community something like what jinnah wanted for muslims overall which is actually anti democratic you know if they are indian citizens they need to you know somehow get integrated and um, on the other hand, uh, we need to have some voice for people who are Indian uh, in identity and civilization who are, may not be living in India. So there is this uh, strange dichotomy happening in Indian Indian states. So maybe it might be a, a possibility for the Roma to regain some sense of dignity, even if they don't have their state, because they are, you know, definitely of Indian civilization and a very strong influence of Indian civilization in Europe. So they basically brought a lot of music to Europe, right? So the European music has become so much richer because of India and, and Roma are a valuable contribution for that. So we need to recognize that also in other other areas. So I think that is my comment on the Roma issue. Just uh, something to add to that, that uh, uh, the, the Roma communities, do you know the word they use for themselves? It's Manusha. They just call themselves people because they want to be seen as people, as normal people who are, you know, uh, equal citizens to everyone else, uh, which was the case for 40 years or 44 years from 1945 to 1989. But then those protections were lost during the glorious fall of the wall and uh, velvet revolutions and whatnot. And as a result, it is a, a good opportunity for India to step in. Uh, Sushma Swaraja, the late uh, uh, external affairs minister did a lot of outreach in that regard. And I'm glad that Kiran brought up the issue of uh, parliament because as of two years ago in 2019, uh, the two nom nominated seats for Anglo Indians was uh, scrapped since there isn't a significant enough population. And uh, there is going to be a parliamentary expansion and uh, redrawing of constituencies in the next five years that the new parliament has space for a thousand seats. Many, it's important to remember that it's normal in many other countries that have a diaspora to have parliamentary constituencies outside its own territorial board, borders. So you can have you know, an MP for NRI interests in every continent if you want. You can have an MP for North America and a member of parliament for South America, for the Caribbean, for Oceania. And this is where there are many people in uh, Fiji, in Trinidad, in Guyana, in uh, Canada, uh, in the US, and in Europe as well. And similarly, we can have one for uh, or two for the Roma communities to ensure that their voices are heard and that they feel included in the civilizational project that is the uh, evolving Indian Republic. Great. So uh, I think we have only two pointers left to discuss because we have discussed persona ficta very well, which is fictional sovereignty. <laughs> I think we have discussed many narrations on that. So the two things which remain to discuss are, one is India's cultural policy and the Indo-European connect. And that could also be one of the things. I mean, Richard gave the example of the Roma, Romani community because of one of the comments we got. And uh, one thing which we have to discuss also as a part of the dis discussion to conclude for tonight is uh, basically how in the information age, civilizational states like India should act, not just based on the uh, Twitter fiasco and you know the basic issues which we are having with these big tech companies, but also in terms of asserting it, because uh, I'll come on the information technology part later, but let's discuss the Indo-European part and we can maybe start with Karthike. But before that, I'll just give a 20 second or 30 second context. So uh, my proposition is very simple, is that the Indo-European community, of course, from a lingual perspective, stems from the Indian subcontinent to Europe. And of course, it has its own uh, considerations within the ASEAN region. I will not definitely mention about uh, certain specific references, but uh, I must very humbly state that uh, 
generally if countries have a cultural policy like if they try to do like work it's very rightly suggested about representation in the parliament and it's one of the i would say a very interesting and brilliant idea uh, apart from representation maybe rejuvenation could be done because we all know that let's take an example so everybody knows that in the united states indian americans are always called out as south asian americans and a lot problematic things happen but try to do that with vietnamese americans and the community will protest <laughs> and not just protest it will actually impact try to do it with uh, jewish americans who are israeli lovers please uh, face the consequences so i mean the united states people know it very well uh, with the so called south asian people i think the only issue is that of course we know the continuity problem and a lot we have discussed but my proposition is that if we have an indo european linkage then one benefit that we get is that maybe starting from eastern europe i don't know because i don't think so western europe is much influenced in that sense maybe starting from eastern europe and up to asean a whole bridge of cooperation can come in so i am resting my case here and we can discuss this maybe per person just 3 minutes with a follow up of 2 minutes let's try to adhere that and let's then talk about the information age because the information age part is very interesting and then maybe we will conclude with some questions so i think karthik you can begin so now uh... this uh, d- if i understood the question properly you are trying to say whether there's a indo european cultural uh, uh, linkage and how can we use it for our benefit basically so yeah right yeah so to continue uh, to uh, talk about that it's a very controversial topic in india and uh, i am not going to go into the debate about who came from where and where <laughs> where they spread so just uh, just one out. question just one question i'm not talking about ait i'm not talking about oit we're not I talking know. about history yeah. yeah so no problem yeah so, yeah. so uh, as far as culture values are concerned in that scenario i think the closest we can get with uh, with a particular state in europe is greece because of our historical and cultural uh, uh, you know relations and also how our history has been shaped how our uh, how we became a part of a vanquished community under a a religious minority which actually was a victor and how they exploited us so there are certain uh, you know uh, uh, these sort of relationship historical relationships and then also uh, how our opponent is kind of the same nature and in the same team so that should be a united fact uniting factor to that uh, particular country and uh, the the other country i can talk about is iran because as we are talking about the, the the culture so iran can also become a very good important uh, of you know uh, a linkage but as we see that it is not materializing into something because uh, iran has is is doing you know like is 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 actually a friend with china also and also uh, in time doing a time pass with india so we don't know how that is going to materialize but this is my brief answer to that and maybe the discussion goes on and then i can see some entry points so i will i will uh, interject okay i give a small uh, uh, summary of what i think because i live in europe and i am indian and uh, i think europe and india have a lot of things in common especially when you look at the diversity of europe in language so india has a lot of diversity in language and and that is a very strong connecting point and we have to learn from europe on this issue how they actually rejuvenated their languages and made them scientific and technically applicable uh, and we need to develop our languages so a lot of the problems that we have you know civilizational identity and all that it is asserting ourselves i see that as just um, symptoms of a disease the disease itself is actually the lack of cultural vigor in our languages we we don't express uh, our science technology in our own languages and uh, once we have that we will we will be able to connect our cultural and ethical moral ideals in 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 naturally very naturally to that and and that is uh, one strong aligning point with between india and europe and, and because europe has linguistic diversity and there we have a strong aligning factor 
So I, I, there I include all European states, including France, Germany, rich, powerful states. Um, we need to actually engage in a multilingual um, exchange and democracy there. And a lot of Indians need to, you know, step beyond the Anglosphere and also be open for other other languages because they need to see what's working and, and ultimately also develop their own languages. So this uh, language issue uh, and, and there, the Indo-European community, when you look at it as a linguistically connected community, we have a very, very strong asset, which is the Sanskrit language, you know, and if you develop it, everybody else would also be able to reconnect to their ancient deep past, which is, you know, some for, for it happened in the past centuries, but it is not a finished project. So we have a big, huge asset, you know, and, and, and uh, we need to develop that. It's also not necessarily Sanskrit per se. All Indian languages have that. Like European languages are connected to the Prakrits. They didn't have Sanskrit. You know, Sanskrit, we developed it within India. So the relation they had with, with various Prakrits. So we need to first, you know, re rejuvenate our own languages and um, express. So this, for me, my passionate project is to, you know, express uh, scientific and technical matters in Telugu, my mother tongue because it's ridiculous that we don't have it. You know, when I express uh, to my friends in Europe that we have our constitution in English, that itself is a big you know, red flag. We, we Indians don't realize the, how, how pathetic that is. <laughs> we don't have our constitution in our own native languages. So we need to, you know, first uh, develop that. And once we have sufficient um, force, cultural force, uh, in academia and media and culture overall, where we are able to, you know, uh, use the strong power of one billion plus people in our own languages, then naturally there will be an alignment between uh, the Indo-European community. So that is my my point here. And uh, Kiran, w uh, wasn't it you recently who tweeted that, that according to the Japanese conception of history and civilizations, there's a distinct Japanese civilization, distinct Chinese civilization, and an Indian civilization, which yeah. in their understanding extends to Europe? It extends to Europe and West Asia. And it's similar, it's funny, uh, Chinese also see, see it the same way. The Japanese very clearly uh, mentioned it also probably in literature, but Chinese... Uh, um, I had a Chinese friend who once said, look at you, you just look like a European, but darker. <laughs> essentially, that is the, the opinion of the Chinese. So essentially, it's like uh, 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 they, they have a general understanding that the Indian Indosphere influenced a lot of West Asia and also Europe. Uh, the Orientals see it like that. And the Europeans at some point also saw it like that. But uh, unfortunate fact is that uh, we have a very different religion and uh, civilizational idea. So we also have to respect the differences, right? So at some point, we will not be able to just uh, have a uniform uh, everywhere. But um, yeah, it's it's a good point. Uh, we, we have things in common with Europe. And we also have, in some sense, complementary things in common with uh, Asians, like uh, Japanese, Cambodians, and so on. So India is from my point of view, is center of the world. We need to just realize that and, and express it properly. Yeah. I, th I think uh, to build upon this, you know, it's important to reconceptualize our understanding of the world as there not being a distinct Asia and a distinct Europe, but think of it as Eurasia. It's a continuum, a geographical continuum. It's one entity uh, and Europe is a peninsula or a subcontinent, just like uh, the Indian subcontinent or just like Southeast Asia. Now, if we look at Europe today, and uh, if we look at a narrow definition of Europe as the European Union, the European Union today is trying to become what the Union of India is already, uh, and is trying to invent you know, a pan-European civilizational identity wherein multiple you know, linguistic uh, groups can work together under a common banner and through common political institutions, which then uh, harness this, you know, what they call Judeo-Christian values. But yeah, let's be honest, it's Christian values. They were killing Jews 70 years ago uh, with a great gusto and with the consent of the people uh, and enthusiastic consent in some countries. Now, uh, with this in mind, you know, we need to treasure what we have as well that uh, there's uh, so many people who are like, uh, oh, you know, we need to be more like uh, Europe. How are we supposed to be more like Europe? They're trying to be more like us. You know, we already have the foundations for 
this you know pan indic civilizational state the question is when do we start deploying it now the european union doesn't even have a fully formed fully matured set of institutions but it still exports it va its values it still constantly talks about oh this is a values based project and it's about defending human rights at home and abroad uh, if you want to join the eu there's this you know document of requirements that you have to live up to in order to be accepted which uh, some countries uh, uh, managed to do and some countries gave up and <laughs> became antagonistic like turkey uh now that's uh, an important lesson for us as well that uh, we've already done the hard work we've already created the state now the question is to reform it so that it can be used as a vessel it can be used as a mechanism to advance our interests for that we need to define what our interests are define what our values are and that should come from the bottom up it should be from the people not top down imposed like the current set of values and then use the institution of the state and shape them in a way that is the most effective to achieve these uh, goals to achieve these interests to pursue these interests and uh, to live up to these values and protecting and projecting them in order to do that uh, we need to reimagine ourselves our place in the world and our relationship with the state the social contract the constitution bureaucracy police judiciary they all need to reflect the aspirations of the people it can't be that we're just satisfied with this status quo from uh, the end of the british raj where we put a human face on the same sadistic uh, institutions that were designed to extract revenue and suppress uh, popular demands but rather people should be invested in the success or failure of the state they need to identify with the state right now the state is this uh, abstract entity that exists above you and your interactions with it are overwhelmingly negative if you go to a police station it's a negative experience if you go to the district collectorate it's a negative experience if you go to a court it's a negative experience so people live their whole lives trying to avoid interacting with the state because that's a punishment in itself now if you reimagine the state from the bottom up then the state should be serving the people and that's the ultimate objective of reform can i add something really quick um, please, i just please. want to say that uh, what you said richie is so true um the state and the people have a huge gap between them they don't the civil the civil servants don't see themselves as um as you know employed by the people which they are but they see themselves as you know superior and uh, you know presiding over the masses um and uh, this is obviously because of the inheritance of the colonial um you know structures um but you know um uh, reform i think um yeah reforming the bureaucracy and the institutions definitely we need to orient them towards a sort of you know the indian world view and um re you know reestablish their roots uh in this country and that comes that comes uh, largely through you know cultural um a renaissance a cultural renaissance a cultural reconnection and uh, for this we can look towards the east more than the west the west is not is not in line with our values the west right now there's there's too much influence of the west there's too there's too much american media there's too much like literally the entire world consumes american media and that that sort of adds to their uh, you know their importance as a nation uh, but for us um, western media only serves to distance ourselves from our roots and um, consumption of english media obviously yeah we need to um, we need to counter this with a sort of uh, um resurgence of our own languages like kiran mentioned because a, the language is what binds people to their culture so even if you take um even if you take like 20 30 years ago why are why why do why do our parents not get the reference the cultural references uh that are uh, hidden in our uh, 
you know our languages and our uh, uh, mythology and all of that in our texts why do they e so easily understand references and uh, certain concepts that we don't is because of the uh, language we we are uh, subservient to our english medium education and that's a huge that plays a huge role in us not only going on to consume uh, only western media but also um us uh internalizing the fact that uh, this is the only um model to emulate um and uh, we become you know players in the in their game in the western game so they, they the the minute we start realizing that uh, civilization is not uh, an economic concept like when when um when europe came and said we are uncivilized they didn't mean we are uncivilized in the in the economic sense because we had we had we were rich but the the point is that uh today when um when we see civilization they mean a cultural uh, entity so what happens is like i said when europe calls us uncivilized they mean that we don't subscribe to their culture and their uh, idea of what a civilization is they don't mean that we're technologically or scientifically backward uh, which is a, which is a sort of you know a dual meaning of the word civilization so we need to realize that civilization is has much more cultural concept to it than we realize and assert our cultural uh, uh dominance and we don't need to do it to the rest of the world we just need to uh, do it domestically because um that's what will um you know create a certain like you said uh, uh, a bullheaded determination in the indian people to serve their own country not just serve but uh to connect with their state so and for this you know there's huge reforms needed i can't even educational reforms like judicial reforms uh bureaucratic reforms like it's just endless but uh, you know i guess it's a start talking about it great so to be very fair we are already past 90 minutes so what we will do is that we will try to crystallize the concluding part of this discussion which is it is with respect to information age so i mean i agree with all the propositions which have been made and to be fair enough uh i would say that even we can you know spread our civilization civilizational reach as we call about through cultural diplomacy by manufacturing the way human rights is also asserted all over the world because at the end of the day the value system thing which is being produced you the human rights is also one part of it it can be done through sustainability and many things so considering that uh we all know about the information age okay the information age is very different from the cold war era it has its own experience and blueprints from the cold war era because of the simple reason that the way technology is defined and understood and information processing information sharing all of it which is done that also shapes your geopolitical as well as individual sovereign interests and we can't deny that in fact the information age has atomized into more encouragement of individuality and individualism now both of them are different because one of them is a reality one of them is kind of an ideology but so for india the one problem that we see is that of course digital colonization is a problem we are trying to come up with a solution we developed our social media guidelines but Uh, from a long run perspective and which is not just about your economics and regulatory authorities which we need to have otherwise i could have had a technology law panel on that one thing which we need to uh, estimate is that because of course i mean uh, regulatory issues and all of those are a part of technology and we could have on that but to frame it in a very decent way one problem which i see is that since there is a lack of cultural commitment most of the time what happens is that uh neither our lawmakers nor our policy makers are able to contribute now i i'll give you two examples to prove why let's take the gdpr for example okay it's an amazing regulation although very still i would say not that much competent because of the simple reason that it was actually framed in 2015 and then adopted in 2017 came into force in 2018 your disruptive technologies already went ahead 
they already made their own ways to bypass the gdpr okay then you have other legal mechanisms in other countries so gdpr is one technology law thing but let's take the indian legal understanding now we all know that the indian legal understanding is highly colonial whether it is defining what is religion or whether it is understanding identities like caste and so forth now in both of them although very unrelated issues one thing which we see is that how you understand culture as a subject matter makes a lot of things practically working in gdpr i think my understanding i may be wrong on that i think much of the gdpr's inspiration comes from the lingual aspects of maintaining a rules based order that is why their data protection principles are so rigid that's why they have right to be forgotten and all of that stuff and i think that's why uh, we see that inspiration in india what i finally see is that uh, since the understanding is heavily colonial and based on like you have a comparative legal understanding copied from somebody else now we all know that in a public discourse everybody says you know this is being copied that is being copied and it's a big issue but again the same issue will come in is that a strategic outlook is always based on your cultural policy and of course the indo european thing is one thing but from a domestic point of view what more most of most of the time which what happens is that we just don't have a proper cultural outlook because we tend to feel that you know it might be secularized or it might be reconciliatory or we just have the fear of a weak state or the struggle is progress syndrome thing so uh, i think karthike can take a perspective on this and then in a clockwise manner we can discuss further and then uh, after that we can have concluding remarks so i'll keep it very brief uh, i believe that you know sovereignty is to a state what independence is to a human being and it is very important to assert your sovereignty and in this age of information it's uh, it's very important to get your uh, particular side of the th of the story to the people and uh, which our government severely lacks that they can't have their uh, their side of story right and uh, and also internationally it's a huge problem so i think it's very important for indian missions abroad to you know have a very regular uh, sort of briefing and the indian government also have a very uh, you know brief uh, briefing for all international journalists working here and also lobbying is also a very good uh, option which we can take as far, far as our cultural aspects are concerned our cultural relations are very dormant right now we have our in, uh, indian um, cultural uh, body which uh, we we don't see a lot of things happening abroad which they can easily do so these are basic policy uh, you know options which the government should do better communication better outreach and then uh, we we when we'll have a story right twitter won't twitter or any other uh, body in the in the future will never dare to you know use our uh, the their the, the pr which is created by the liberal media of authoritarian government for their own benefit yes kiran yeah okay uh, my comment is that uh, uh, the it policy is just reflection of our non digital world which is also pretty pathetic you know we don't have media in our native languages we don't express we don't allow expression of our ideas you know based on a lot of things but essentially it comes down to law academia everything being shunted down in silos which are all you know anti creative and anti uh, anti expressive um, so the digital world is pretty bad but must, let's see like let's go to a bookstore and see how many books we have in indian languages right so in germany for example um, we have translations in german from literature from many other languages from french from chinese from english obviously but into german yeah why don't we translate the world literature into indian languages we don't we just read english and we think that the anglo world is actually everything and that is a disease which actually percolates into the digital world this is what's happening you know we just are so focused on to the into the anglo control and and this is why we also keep using these types of software right we don't have native software we don't have software is actually a reflection of our uh, cultural values so we are not building our cultural values through software uh, because we don't see the need for it and we that is actually a disease that is affecting the non digital world as well so uh, in order to reform it well, i i see that not as a, a policy issue like gdpr you know it can help the regulation would definitely help from the government point of view but what we really need is actually a bottom up growth like a growth like a garden 
you know of different uh, conscious values and a, a critical thing here is actually expressiveness in our native tongue through our native idiom what saipri i mentioned you know idioms coming from our cultural mythology from stories india is the land of stories so we invented all these things so why are we not expressing it uh, in our native idiom so uh, this this is something that the government can encourage this is something that the private foundations can also encourage and treat this as like a long term battle like you know 20 30 years it's not something that will be fixed in 10 years 2 years uh, the it policy is just you know uh, it's, we are, we will be playing catch up uh, inevitably you know irrespective of the talent that we have irrespective of the huge potential that we have in india we will be playing catch up for the next 20 30 years but what next do we survive after 20 30 years or we get are we getting wiped out so if you want to survive we need to you know look at the problem from the non digital world point of view as well and and let's just yeah recreate uh, yeah a, 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 a vibrant culture a literary culture in our native languages native idiom and part of that will percolate naturally into the digital arena and uh, um, and when we express more and more uh, in our native languages and our native idiom we will create at some point we'll get fed up with twitter why why bother about twitter <laughs> we will create our own software which is more you know more uh, aligned with our values and with our it desires what we want to use and twitter would also learn and it will also reform itself you know they don't want to lose the market i am not anti twitter you know but uh, at some point we need to realize the the problem at the core and and look at it as a long term problem you know we need we need some strategic uh, uh, vision for you know 20 30 years uh, abdul kalam used to say vision 2020 let's have vision 2050 you know something that we need to build by 2050 so that we don't just you know get wiped out our languages don't get wiped out our cultural ideals don't get wiped out and, and we just you know uh, step into the f- future as a confident civilization and uh, that is a long term problem right so that is my point here all right spot on i think uh, you've done a great job at identifying the structural issues here that when you look at how you know the law not individual laws like gdpr or regulations like that but the law as a corpus of uh, of uh, knowledge exists in uh, in india it all dates back to the uh, aftermath of 1857 when the east india company saw the threat of native revivalism and rebellion as a result the indian uh, penal code the policing standards uh everything that we know you know and think is natural today came in the 10 years after that during the transfer from the east india company to the british crown as a result what were these laws designed for to prevent a repeat of 1857 now when you look at it with this lens there have not been enough reforms of these laws in the post independence period and as a result what we have is this two tiered india where the common people are still oppressed by a colonial era set of laws and uh, state machinery while a tiny elite that somehow you know is hand picked and filtered through the system through the education system is designed to become honorary whites they become brown sahibs and are generally exported abroad uh and this is something that is a systemic issue because as a result what has become aspirational it's still as aspirational today as it was during the british raj to become a honorary white to become a brown englishman and identify with those values and this is you know the origin story so to speak of sri aurobindo as well it's the origin story of netaji subhash chandra bose as well and eventually they saw the you know hypocrisy of the system and rebelled against it and became very fierce critics of the anglo or anglo spheres uh, cultural hegemony over our hearts and and minds yes as uh, some you know call it today the indo anglian uh, <laughs> community as opposed to the anglo indian community and uh, this is something that the stranglehold over our hearts and minds needs to be broken and it is to be broken by learning that countries exist outside of the five big english speaking countries there's you know there's a world beyond the uk canada australia new zealand uh and the us uh learn from countries in asia so learn from sri lanka next door 
learn from China and Vietnam. These are two countries that are already living in the future. They have a fully decolonized indigenous uh, set of state institutions. And they did it because they fought for their independence. They weren't granted independence like India or Mali. You know, they fought for it and purged their country of collaborators and purged their countries of colonial remnants. That's something important to learn. And uh, if we want to look to the West, then look at what Turkey did after they, uh, after the experience of the First World War and the Ottoman Empire was dismembered. What did Atatürk do? You know, did he uh, uphold the old systems, the, the old legal system uh, of the the Caliphate? No, he created a brand new set of laws, a new penal code, a new civil code. It was year zero. The foundation of a republic does, should not mean any continuity with the past. It should be year zero. You're starting from scratch with a new set of laws, a new constitution, new set of institutions. That needs to happen sooner or later. And it will happen whether I want it or not, whether we want it or not, because these things are historically inevitable. When there's enough momentum behind the people, as people experience increased material prosperity and increased physical security, they will have the mental space to seek their ambitions through the state, to uh, get the state to reflect their values. And it will take one form or another, but we will have a new form of state in the next 30 years. Great. Oh, uh, I see Karthik had a little comment as well, that when Atatürk sure. came to power, uh, he also purged the Turkish language of any Persian influence. So all the Farsi words in, in Persian uh, were replaced with original words from <laughs> the Turkic homeland, from Turkestan, so from uh, Kazakhstan and, uh, and Xinjiang. Great. So uh, let's go on with some concluding remarks of out of this first discussion, because this will go on. We might come up with some other corollaries and we will discuss further. So let's go for a one minute conclusion and we can start with Karthike and then let's see how this goes. So I think it has been an amazing discussion so far. We have discussed the contours which are necessary. <laughs> I mean, uh, from continuity to other things. So let's see how this develops in the further discussions, but let's go with the conclusion. So Karthika, you can go ahead. So uh, I think that the, the discussion itself has been very uh, enlightening and anybody hearing it doesn't need a basic concluding remarks. But if I have to you know, limit myself to that, I would say that like Richard pointed uh, a very interesting point that Europe is trying to become India now. I think there's one policy which I really like of the European Union. I don't know whether it's still in practice. It was. Uh, two, three years ago, was this Erasmus program of uh, European students going to other countries and staying with the family and learning, you know, finding their, uh, there's this, you know, reimagining their European identity sort of and learning the differences. And I think that's a very good policy. And I think uh, if that happens in India, to, I don't, I am not seeing that exactly the same policy, something to that effect that, you know, there's more interaction of Indian students going south of India or in the northeast or the west and the, the people from northeast coming to the north uh, household living with the family because we are very diverse in our practices and our food and I think that's a very good way to uh, you know know each other and find the com commonalities between uh, different regions of India and I think that's a very good policy which we can have. Now coming back to the concluding remarks of this discussion as we have said that there are certain civilizational values of the society and the state is the, the primary responsibility of the state is to further those uh, interests. And, uh, and at the end of the day, it's all about political will of how much a state is willing to, you know, assert itself and is ready to dilute its uh, characteristic or fundamental norms. And so at the end of the day, it's all political uh, uh, will and choice. So we have to work on that, that uh, the, our uh, societal aspirations should be reflected in the government policies and government action. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I would like to just conclude this. Uh, there is nothing to conclude. There's a lot of things we need to start discussing here, obviously. Um, but from my point of view, uh, 
a very important thing is that uh, we need to look beyond the Anglosphere. Uh, because as long as we are narrowing down the discussion within the Anglosphere, within, within, into the English language, we are not a state. Forget a civilizational state. We are a colony, right? And uh, we need to look at good examples in our neighborhood, like Richard mentioned from Sri Lanka and Vietnam, uh, and also other uh, countries. We need to look at it systematically. That means we need to translate uh, texts, essays, media, culture from those languages into our languages. And that basically is a way of you know, uh, GDP in our native languages. So where, where is the incoming, uh, you know, input, uh, translatory input into our languages? Uh, as long as we are, you know, paying a toll to English every time we discuss and we are narrowing our discussion through the English language, naturally the New York Times will be the boss on, on our heads. So whatever things that they rubbish that they write about us would be the you know the go-to, uh, and the English Wikipedia would be the boss over over our heads. It's 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 natural. That is coming entirely because we haven't grown up out of our uh, colonial past. We are just you know narrow, kind of following the same trend. So we need to kind of encourage um, this kind of a trade of ideas between the world languages and Indian languages. And then at some point, the, 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 the strength of this wave would be so strong that what things which we, we think are complicated, like state apparatus or uh, international geopolitics, they would be like trivial to accomplish. We will have so much of uh, self-consciousness within the Indian public that this would be just ridiculous. You know, the Chinese have it. Like when, when you do something like this, the Chinese, uh, they don't, uh, you know, if the New York Times would say something like this, they would not, you know, uh, they will take it with a bucket of salt. <laughs> it's, it's just rubbish. So we don't have it because we are actually uh, channeled in our minds. So, uh, you know, a lot of our brain power is going through that narrow channels where a toll is getting extracted. So let's just get rid of that at some point, <laughs> not immediately, probably, but uh, we need to, you know, nurture our own garden, essentially. And uh, it's a long term pro uh, project for the civilization state to ultimately reach its ideal. Right. Yeah. All right. Concluding remarks, then uh, what's very important uh, to add to what's been already said is to uh, acknowledge that, you know, some people say that, oh, you know, India suffers from too much democracy. I actually feel we don't have enough democracy and the little we have is wasted in the wrong places and all these indirect elections on this duplication of efforts between the state and the, the uh, union government. Uh, this needs to be simplified and the state needs to be reimagined from the bottom up uh, so that people, you know, an ordinary citizen in their district, it can be urban, it can be rural, has the ability to shape his or her own destiny, who has the ability to demand better policy implementation at the grassroots, to demand uh, police, a judiciary, uh, a bureaucratic uh, machinery that delivers rights and services to them. For that, we need to move beyond this uh, uh, structure of uh, regional satraps, you know, in, in each corner acting like elected rajas who then rule over their praja, you know, their subjects. They're not citizens. They're, they're you know, your subjects. You, know, you beg them for a vote once in five years and then they beg you for the next five years to, oh, please shower some benevolence on, on me, on my district, on my street, build a road, put a street lamp. That's not an MP or an M MLA's job. It's not even a chief minister's job. That should be completely decentralized. So what I would recommend, and you know, and I know that Indian policymakers don't have imagination and don't have an appetite for risk. So this is why, you know, I will, you know, give context, you know, because you know they always want to be shown that some other country, some successful country has already done this. Oh, now we can do it. Yeah, so don't do anything new. I don't expect you to do anything new. Look at Japan and France and Sri Lanka. These three countries did away with the state government. They have a central government and they have district government. They have district prefecture, uh, prefectures. Each of these districts, each of these prefectures has an elected he executive head who is responsible for policy implementation there and reports directly to the federal government. The federal government has 
the power to set laws for the whole country. It's one country. You should have one set of laws. You shouldn't have uh, different tax codes in different states. You shouldn't have different laws in different states. And ideally, give people the right to have referenda so that they can amend laws and push the laws that they want to see through mass mobilization. Now, this is something that is possible because we already have 740 districts in the country, reclassify them as states, but remove the state legislatures. You don't need that many legislatures. Why, do you, why does that exist? It's a patronage structure. Why does each state need to make its own laws? It's just an employment generation scheme for a bunch of unemployable politicians. No. <laughs> so have a thousand MPs in parliament and have 750 districts with an elected head and see the difference in how people engage with uh, the state and how people identify and invest in the success or failure of the state. Well, that reminds me of the Ministry of Cooperation. So <laughs> much can be of it. <laughs> yes, uh, Sabria, please. Yeah, so like uh, Ruchi said, a lot of stuff needs to be decentralized and also the influence of the center needs to increase in some spheres just because the central is the, you know, the uniting force. So the center needs to increase its reach, but also withdraw from certain areas like local infrastructure, local, local infrastructure, local, uh, you know, education policies, all of this. Um, needs to be from the community. They need to meet the community's needs and be extremely localized because um, the, the diversity is such that of not just language, but culture and traditions and people is such that you can't have, you can have some overarching uh, federal laws, but you can't control everything very effectively from a state level. So yeah, localization, I think, could solve a lot of issues. And this, this if you take US, uh, they have... Uh, the states are kind of, uh, they have their own constitutions and their own uh, laws. Um, and they're, they're at times, you know, uh, antagonistic to the, the, you know, the countries, but um, it's, it's the will of their people. So what happens is um, even within the state, uh, you see, you see communities um representing themselves in their local politics very effectively, representing their interests very effectively. Um, and that's because uh, each town's, uh, um, you know, interests are very ex extremely, uh, uh, you know, taken seriously rather, taken seriously in the sense that um, the, the, you know, if you take, you know, the district attorneys, the uh, the senates, the senators, and all of that, they take their constituency uh, and the uh, and the needs of their community very seriously. They're often from that community. Um, but uh, and even in bureaucracy, you see people from that community being represented there. What hap what the the one of the mistakes of Indian bureaucracy is that if I want to help my hometown, I can't just go and start helping my hometown or my my ancestral village or whatever, like wherever my uh, people are from, I can't, I can't go and start help. If I move to an urban area for economic progress and I want to go back and help, I can't because bureaucrats are distributed in a central fashion and there'll be some uh, uh, Oriya MP there. I mean, not MP, sorry, Oriya collector there, or there'll be someone from uh, Bengal and they don't represent the needs of the people there very effectively. So there needs to be a system where people can help their own community. The young, the young people in that area can represent their interests in their own uh, uh, policy. You know, the, the, none of none of the none of the infrastructure and all of needs are going to be met if you if you see an MP that's just you know condescendingly uh, um, uh, looking only towards his own self interest and his own monetary gain. This, is, this will never change if we don't uh, reform that sort of uh, that sort of you know them being proxy for the colonial uh, institutions like they, it's not going to happen and uh, not just in politics but in bureaucracy they need to go hand in hand they they, they they're quite often 
you know uh, work uh, antagonistic to each other they none of the bureaucrats are accountable for their actions none of the bureaucrats can be transferred or you know um, you know held accountable for their actions and it's just a it's just a mess the 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 way the way the civilization can assert itself is by ha- by connecting with the people you need to represent their interests at a local level and then you can have a overarching federal structure that represents the whole country uh, uh, just just pr- there shouldn't be as much central interference in many of these aspects so um, yeah like uh, ruchir mentioned it's it's a great point to increase uh, local uh, you know interaction great indeed appreciated so to end on a very cheerful note i would like to share a meme only for the sake of fun but of course related to our uh, whatever reality so please enjoy this meme and then we'll end the session i think we really had a, a very interesting episode and please enjoy this meme and i think you all can relate with this meme i think so <laughs> so <laughs> kind of a oh. uh, this is the one i made yesterday oh wow <laughs> yeah i saw this it has oh. my watermark on it but it's it is a meme lord you don't know that wow <laughs> i mean that's really amazing okay do you want to read it out for people who can't see me? sure so uh, here it says chuju so it's like voicing out so somebody is saying i think he's a driver he's saying oh mr fernandez there is neo colonial on the tracks so he says directly sampurna kranti of narayan bhavi itihas mara and then they just crash along so i mean really interesting so it's a hilarious hilarious template uh thank you for promoting my bad <laughs> meme i didn't think it would go onto a video like this but oh great <laughs> no i think uh, we can have much better editions of it so <laughs> who knows so i think on that cheerful note we end this episode and we will be coming up with an amazing episode for global hint on risk analysis in a multipolar order on tuesday uh, an interesting episodes will come again but we have the global law assembly conference so stay ahead with for that also we will have some interesting live sessions in the coming weeks so please stay ready until then not going to tell who is going to be the future speakers and all that but thank you so much for joining and with this never be the same know the world beyond thanks so much <laughs>